Hello doctors. Today, in this video, let's talk about a very very high yield topic that is about the glomerular disorders. Usually, in the kidney section, however, you may remember all the values and the formulas, but understanding the concepts is as important as remembering all those values. So, first, let's talk about the basics on the glomerulus and kidney filtration. Then, we'll talk about the nephritic and nephrotic sy syndrome pathophysiology. Then, we'll go to the topic of renal stones. Now, let's start. Now, if you see, this is the glomerulus. This is the Bowman's capsule. This is a nephron. Usually, the blood comes in and then it goes out. It comes in, filters the unwanted products which will be passed into the urine and the rest of the blood goes back. In this process, all the blood urea nitrogen and creatinine all those products are filtered out. Now, if you see, this is a blood vessel. And in the blood vessel, it is lined with endothelial cells. And then, there is a basement membrane. Just see, this is just a resemblance of this picture. There is a blood vessels, these blood vessels are lined with endothelial cells and then there is a basement membrane. After that, there are podocytes. These are the podocytes. And then there is the tubules. Now, let's revise. We have the endothelial cells in the blood vessels, a basement membrane and the epithelial cells that is the podocytes. If you see here, these cells are the epithelial cells, which has the podocytes. And these are the tubules, proximal tubule, which continues into distal tubules, and then the urine is excreted by it. Now, if you see, let's see, let's take this basement membrane, and it's related with the endothelium and the epithelium. This place is below the endothelium is the subendothelial layer. Then above the epithelium, it is the subepithelial layer. It may be above, but it is below the basement membrane. So technically we call it the subepithelial layer. Now this is important because in many diseases, in the nephritic and nephrotic syndrome, we will see some com immune complexes being deposited either here or here. We will call that as subepithelial deposits or subendothelial deposits. So, at that time, you must remember this. Now, to begin with the pathological processes, we have the nephritic syndrome. Nephritic syndrome usually arises when there is a problem with the endothelium or in the basement membrane. If you see, if there is a problem or break here, that is closely with the blood vessels. So, all the inflammatory cells are roaming inside in these blood vessels. Those inflammatory cells come here and clump together. Usually, when there is a problem here, first there would be blood leak. And then there would be inflammatory cells surrounding here. Gradually, the kidney function of filtration would get decreased. But when there is a problem in the epithelial cells or the podocytes, that would mostly cause a nephrotic syndrome. If you see here, this part is not attached with the blood. So, there would be no inflammation. But the major problem here is that there would be massive leak of the proteins. But there is no inflammation. Now, let's see about the pathophysiology of nephritic syndrome. 
you see in the nephritic syndrome we saw that there was a damaged filtration barrier this part is the filtration barrier this part is being damaged so what happens is that there would be blood loss in the urine and we will have inflammation since there is loss of blood there would be some loss of protein also but what happens is that due to loss of blood in urine there would be rbc cast and the urine would be very dark now the blood is lost in that urine via the tubules so whenever the rbc go into the tubules they can clump together and form a shape just like the tubule and then later they would come out in the urine so when they come out in the urine those clumped rbcs will be in the shape of the tubules that would be called as an rbc cast and due to blood the urine will be very dark and due to inflammation there would be clumping of inflammatory cells and damage to the filtration membrane so there will be very low filtration rate so there would be uremia uremia means all the toxic product which usually will should be high in the urine would now be high in the blood because they are not filtered from the blood then we will have hypertension this is because when there is low filtration rate there is not much of fil filtration happening from the blood so the volume inside the blood vessels is increased because there is no loss of volume in the urine so only there is gain of volume in the blood vessels when there is gain of volume in the blood vessels those vessels are stretched and tensed so that would cause hypertension when there is more fluid in the blood vessels that would be called as high hydrostatic pressure as we have seen in our previous videos if there is high hydrostatic pressure there would be fluid leak so from the blood there would be fluid leak and the patient would develop edema the patient would have mostly ed bilateral edema in the legs or periorbital edema and also the patient will have oliguria there is not much of urine being filtered so there is less urine formed now due to we as we said there is protein loss in urine there is only a mild protein loss because the patient is not producing urine itself the patient is oliguric so though even though the protein is being lost it is not much as in the nephrotic syndromes so this is how the symptoms in the nephritic sy syndrome are developed the main thing to be remembered is edema oliguria and rbc casts now let's see the pathophysiology of the nephrotic syndrome if you see here the main problem here was the damaged podocytes or the epithelial cells due to that there would be massive protein loss some of the main important proteins to be named are antithrombin for example antithrombin 3 Now what is antithrombin? Thrombin forms the blood clot. Antithrombin does not let the blood to clot. So when there is loss of antithrombin, there is more of thrombin, so there is more of blood clot. Now due to loss of albumin, there would be edema. Now whenever the albumin is lost, there would be decrease oncotic pressure in the blood vessels since albumin is the most available protein in the blood vessels loss of albumin would decrease the oncotic pressure to understand this just think that usually there is equal amount of protein and water in the blood vessels now when there is loss of protein there would automatically be more water so to maintain the ratio 
there is some water lost out so that now the level of water and protein will be equal in the blood vessels. So that is how the patients would develop edema. And then the immunoglobulins are also lost so the patient is prone to infections. There is also protein loss in the so due to protein loss in the urine, the urine would be very frothy with more of bubbles. This is mainly seen in the massive protein urea and less commonly seen in mild protein urea like in the nephritic syndromes. Now there is the patient would develop hyperlipidemia. This is because there is lots of protein lost and the liver now tries to synthesize everything. With synthesizing protein, it also synthesizes lipids. So as much as the protein is synthesized and lost, there is also lipids synthesized but those lipids are not lost. So the patient would develop hyperlipidemia. So that lipid sometimes when it comes in urine, that would be called as fatty cast. Some of the fat cells can be lost in urine. Then due to the massive protein loss as discussed earlier, the patient would develop edema. The main features of the nephrotic syndrome is massive proteinuria. That is, the value to be remembered is more than 3.5 grams in 24 hours. The patient is also prone to have blood clots and the patient is hyperlipidemic. The levels of albumins in these patients are very less. Now, that was the pathophysiology for nephritic and nephrotic syndrome. Now, let's see an important table that was directly taken from the Robbins pathology. If you see here, whenever there is a glomerular pathology, the patient is usually asked to do a kidney biopsy. Then after doing a kidney biopsy, we check it with light microscopy, electron microscopy and immune fluorescence. In this, in this column, the diseases, the glomerular diseases are mentioned and the nephritic and nephrotic category is mentioned here. Then each have different findings in light microscopy, electron microscopy and immune fluorescence microscopy which would be helpful in differentiating each disease. For example, if you see in minimal change disease, it will be normal in light microscopy and normal in fluorescence microscopy. But you can see loss of food processes in electron microscopy. This is how it is differentiated from other diseases. So, this table is very very high yield to be remembered by you. So, try to read this table and know the contents. Now, let's talk about the kidney stones. First, see the types, pathophysiology and the causes. Then, let's see more on the diagnostics and the surgical treatment. Now, for the pathophysiology, if you see, the problem in these patients is usually the supersaturation of urine with stone forming crystals. That is, in the urine, usually there would be a normal amount of crystals like calcium or uric acid. But when there is more of calcium and uric acid that saturates the urine, there would be these crystals forming. With this also, there is decrease in inhibitors of crystallization. Inhibitors of crystallization, which for example like water, if the patient is not drinking enough water, that would contribute to the pathophysiology of forming a kidney stone. And another high yield point is deposition of stone forming materials on a Randall's plaque. If you see here, in the renal papillae of the renal pyramid, here there would be small plaques forming and then the materials like calcium or some other phosphates can come and bind here. So in a long exposure of calcium that would form a calcium stone. That was the pathophysiology. Now let's see about the type of stones. There are mostly four major types of stones. 
The first one is the calcium stones. These stones are the most common stones. Like 70 to 80 percent of the cases would have calcium stones. And then struvite stones. This picture sh shows a struvite stone. These stones are also called as triple phosphate stones or uh, horseshoe stones. Because of their size, these are usually very large in size and would require a surgical treatment. Then, for the uric acid stones, these stones are usually seen in patients with leukemia and other blood cancers where there would be lots of purine. Uric acid is a product of purine metabolism. This patient would may also have concomitant gout. This, the important thing to know about uric acid stones are, these stones are radiolucent. They are not seen in the x-rays. Then the cysteine stones. These stones are hardest stones. Like in the form of density, they are very hard. Well, let's see about the risk factors. First one, as we all know, high calcium intake. High calcium intake can lead to formation of calcium stones, like calcium phosphate or calcium oxalate stones. And another important point is high vitamin C intake can also form calcium stones. Then low fluid intake can form uh, can form stone due to de uh, decrease in inhibitors of crystallization. Then UTI fin infections are mostly known to cause struvite stones. This is because these UTI sometimes may have urea splitting organisms like Proteus and E. coli. These can form struvite stones. Then hypercalciuria. Idiopathic hypercalciuria, that is more calcium in the urine, is the most common cause of forming calcium stones. And hyperuricosuria, forming uric acid stones. Then alteration in urine pH. Sometimes, if you see, the urine pH can be too much alkaline, forming different types of stones, or too much acidic, forming different types of stones. For example, if the urine pH is too much acidic, it can form uric acid stones. Infrequent urination. When a patient, if you see, if he, if he hesitates to pass urine because of the work hours or something like that, usually if the patient is not urinating as frequently as a normal person should do, then patient is capable of developing a renal stone. Then hyperparathyroidism. If there is hyperparathyroidism, there would be high calcium. Normally, the the function of uh, hyperparathyroid is hyper uh, function of parathyroid is to increase the levels of calcium. If there is hyperparathyroidism, there would be more calcium, forming calcium stones. Then, if the patient is having a family history of stones, then he can develop stones as well. For the clinical features, if you see. Mainly, the patient would come to you with a renal colic because these patients are most of the time asymptomatic. But when they develop symptoms, these are usually stormy symptoms. They may have abrupt, uh, abrupt onset, sudden onset of sharp, severe pain in their flanks, and that pain can radiate to anywhere, depending on the level of stone or the, where the stone is present. The patient can also have nausea, vomiting, and if there is UTI or some other infection, he may also have fever. Patient most of the time are prone to have hematuria, that is blood in the urine, and then hydronephrosis. If you see, normally the urine would pass from the kidneys, then into the ureter, into the bladder. In this way, if there is any stone, and if that stone is obstructing, the passage of urine, then it can cause hydronephrosis. That is, the urine, if, uh, if there is a stone and the proximal part of the stone, those parts will be filled with urine because 
those urine are not able to pass after the stone. Then dietal crisis is usually seen uh, in kidney stone patients like when there would be a mass or lump and pain in the flank region that would normally subside after maturation or passing of the urine. Then for the diagnostics, we should start with basic laboratories like CBC and electrolytes. CBC is mainly for checking the WBC count. If there is high WBC or leukocytosis, that would point to a stone. If there is more like more than 15,000 WBC, that would probably point out to a UTI. And then check up for the electrolytes like calcium levels. If the calcium levels are high if the, or if the calcium levels are low, you may also opt to do uh, parathyroid tests as well. Then do urinalysis to check the pH. If the pH of the urine is alkaline, that is, if it is above 7, these patients are usually formers of struvite stones. Earlier I said that struvite stones are usually seen with UTI cases. This is because when the UTI is caused by urease splitting organisms, those urease can be split and make the urine al alkaline. After that, these truet stones are formed easily. Or if the pH is less than 5, those patients are used to form uric acid stones because the pH of the urine is acidic. Then we do a dipstick test. This is mainly to check for blood in urine or if there are any other crystals in urine. The next step to do is a plain abdomen x ray. Before I said there are radio opaque stones and radiolucent stones. Radio opaque stones are usually stones which tend to show up in the x ray. But radiolucent stones are usually not seen in the x ray. You have to remember about the uric acid stone which is usually not seen in the x ray. Then the x ray also can find and find radio opaque stones that are usually more than 2 mm because if the stone is very very less in size like less than 2 mm it's the, it's very difficult for the plain abdomen x-ray to point out now if if you see in this plain abdominal x-ray you can see a small stone here this might probably be a calcium stone because struvite stones are very big not uric acid stone because uric acid stones are not seen in x-rays. So most probably it can be a calcium stone or a cysteine stone. If you see here, this, there is a very big stone. These are usually the triple phosphate or struvite stones. Then next we have to do abdominal ultrasound. This is usually to check for the hydronephrosis. That is uh, presence of fluid more and more of fluid. Ultrasounds are generally good with liquid items like blood and fluid. So we do this to check if there is hydronephrosis. Usually when the stone is at the kidney or the proximal ureters, after, after pass, uh, if the stone is present at proximal ureters, then the, it's very difficult for the urine to pass the stone. So there is buildup of urine behind the stone that would cause hydronephrosis. If you see in this image an ultrasound of the abdomen, you can see there is this black thing which is the liquid. Here you can see a normal kidney. This is hydronephrosis. Next thing is to do is the IV urography which is the mainstay for diagnosis. We give IV contrast agents to the patient and check and check with the x-ray. Give IV contrast and those IV contrasts will be excreted via the kidneys. So at that time we can do an x-ray. If you see here, 
the contrast agent is coming from the kidneys and going into the bladder. If you give an IV contrast, that would be IV urography. If you give an contrast via the urethra, that would be retrograde pilography. The IV urography and retrograde pilography, which is mainly used for the ureter stones. If you see here, as time passes by, slowly the contrast agent, agent from here would come down here, here, here. So, when you do a serial x-rays, you can find out where the problem is. Now, in this side, the kid, uh, contrast agent may flow, fl flow freely. But in this side, if there is a stone here, for example, then after this, you won't see any contrast agents here. Because all the contrast agents would stop by here itself because there is a stone. So that is how it is useful in diagnosing. Next thing we see is the gold standard diagnostic procedure that is non contrast helical CT. It can, it can find any calculi, even uric acid stones, which is not usually seen in X rays. With this also, it can determine the house Hounsfield units of the stone, that is, determining the density of the stones. As we said before, cysteine stones are very dense. This may be useful especially in the treatment procedure, where some stones can be easily bro broken up, but some, some stones which are very hard can are difficult to break. Now, Let's see about the treatment part of kidney stones. Whenever there is a patient coming to you with severe renal colic, what you have to do is first treat the patient uh, with painkillers and IV hydration, for example like Ketrolac. And then you would give some antiemetics to stop the nausea and vomiting if present. And you can give calcium channel blockers like nifedipine. This can reduce spasms of the smooth muscle because when, uh, when the ureter is a smooth muscle, whenever there is a stone, there would be spasms in the ureter which would cause severe pain. Giving nifedipine would reduce those spasms and tamsulosin which is an alpha 1 blocker can reduce the tone of the spasms of the smooth muscles so the pain would subside. And then after stabilizing the patient, would we would give medical management. If the stone is less than 4 mm, that is usually said to pass out spontaneously. Or we can give thiazide diuretics for calcium stones. We know that thiazide diuretics usually absorb back calcium from the urine. So there would be less calcium in the urine. So there would be less chances of forming a calcium stone. And if the calcium stone is present, it can dissolve it. And we can alkalinize the urine for uric acids and cysteine stones. These stones are usually formed in acidic urine. So what do we do is, we give, we, we alkalinize the urine so that these stones would not be formed. Then for uric acid stones, we can treat it with the gout drugs, the allopurinol. And since stuvite stones are usually associated with UTI, we tend to give antibiotics for stuvite stones. So that is why it is important for you to know about different stones, so that the medical management for each would be different. Now let's talk about the surgical management. The first one would be extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy, that is ESWL. Extracorporeal means outside the body. From outside the body, you give a shock wave which can break the stone, that is lithotripsy, break the stone. So from outside, you give a shock wave which can break the stone. That is how this procedure works. Now this is a non-invasive transfer of waves to break the stone. It means this procedure is not invasive. So that would be a huge advantage for the patient. This, this is usually successful if the stone is less than 20 mm in size or 2 cm in size. It is difficult 
to break very big stones and it is also depends on stone density earlier i said that cysteine stones are very dense and very difficult to break so cysteine stones are usually not breakable so pswl is not used to for cysteine stones the next thing we see here is pcnl that is percutaneous nephrolithotomy percutaneous means via the skin you go into the kidneys to break the stone if you see here you you make an incision in the skin go to the kidneys and break the stone you can do can use an endoscopy to remove the stone or you can use some lasers to break the stone the complications of pcnl is hematuria and hydronemothorax the most common being hematuria blood in the urine because this is obviously an invasive procedure and then we can do ureteroscopy why you take an endoscope and go through the ureters that would be an ureteroscopy you go into the bladder and into the ureters this is useful for distal stones the stones that are present in the bladder or in the distal ureters and you can go there and retrieve the stone then earlier this was the main management like laparoscopic or open nephrectomies or nephrolithotomies with the development of eswl and pcnl these procedures are not commonly done today what we do here is laparoscopic or open nephrolithotomy that is when the stone is in the kidneys or pyelolithotomy when the stone is in the renal pelvis or nephropyelolithotomy when the stone is stone is in between them or ureterolithotomy you open the patient or go through laparoscopically and then break the stone that is in the ureter so that was about the glomerular disorders and renal stones this is a very important topic to be known so know it carefully and if you haven't subscribed our channel subscribe now thank you